Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, also known as CSIS, a bipartisan think tank here in Washington, D.C. And thank you in particular for tuning in to uh, the uh, Renewing American Innovation Project here at CSIS. And in particular today, we want to focus um, on uh, the competition between the United States and our trade partners um, when it comes to, um, to technology and the impact of intellectual property, perhaps patents most important, uh, to that competition. The title of today's program is U.S. Technological Leadership and Patents. What can the data tell us? So let me uh, give a few opening remarks and then turn it over to our uh, panel of experts for this fascinating conversation. Um, you know, uh, we have published here at CSIS in the past uh, 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 with respect to, well, a whole host of issues when it comes to innovation, but in particular that, this, that at this moment in time, America f uh, faces what I call a new Sputnik moment. People will remember the Sputnik moment from the uh, fr from the 1900s, uh, just uh, just a few decades ago, when the United States was locked into heavy competition with the Soviet Union with respect to space, and uh, there was a whole lot of activity and debate as to who will um, uh, lead in space technologies um, in the middle of the century. We were surprised here in the United States when the Soviet Union uh, put the first satellite in space, the Sputnik, and then put the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, um, because all along we thought uh, that we were leading this race. And what happened as a result of that, what became known as a Sputnik moment, uh, was that uh, the leaders of our nation back then, President Kennedy in particular, committed the nation to, um, to regain our technological leadership when it comes to space and to demonstrate that by putting a man on the moon before the 1960s was over. Well, now I believe that we uh, are once again facing a similar type of a moment. We are being outdone perhaps in strategy, technology and manufacturing by yet another authoritarian superpower. Instead of the Soviet Union, this time it is China, the United States, Europe, and all nations who wish to compete need to assess the state of this competition from China and its allies and to implement a muscular innovation strategy that works in the long run. Now, the moments are not exactly the same. There are significant differences between the 20th century Sputnik moment and what we are experiencing today. Back then, it was much easier to see. We could see satellites, we could touch it. There was one thing, you know, spacecraft, uh, one type of technology, generally speaking, that was leading this, this, this competition. Uh, with respect to the space race. We could observe there were tangible metrics and that made it relatively easy to, uh, to have the nation fully committed uh, towards technological advancement when it, comes, when it came to the space race. And that led to significant other areas of technologies that were developed. In today's world though, the situation is somewhat different. The areas of technologies are more diverse. The, uh, the knowledge economy is significantly more complex. And how one measures technological leadership is especially unclear. Take 5G, for example. Who exactly is leading? And how do we measure that? Is it the United States or China? What's the race to innovation in artificial intelligence look like? And who is the emerging leader in biotechnology? What are the trends? And how do we intelligently analyze the increasing amount of data to draw meaningful additional insights and weed out the noise? These are types of issues that we want to explore on today's event. The number of patents 
is one measure. If one just looks at the areas of technology identified in the Made in China 2025 plan, for example, filings by Chinese nationals to China's IP office have grown at an annual rate of 24% year over year between 2006 and 2016. By comparison, such applications filed by US nationals to the United States Patent and Trademark Office grew at an annual rate of only 3% year over year over the same period of time. Many other patenting statistics show similar trends. But these statistics must be taken with a grain of salt. In a report from tw January 2021, for example, the USPTO identified a number of non-market factors that impact these patent trends. For example, studies show that virtually all provinces or municipalities in mainland China have a patent subsidy scheme. These subsidies provide financial incentives to obtain patents. Sometimes the financial rewards being higher than the actual cost of a patent application. Plus, China has established patenting targets and mandates for state-owned enterprises, universities, and public research institutions to obtain intellectual property rights, both domestically in China and around the world. There are also tax incentives and other monetary and non-monetary awards to incentivize increasing numbers of patent filings. All of these impact the patent numbers that we see from China. So all are these all these issues uh, we want to explore on today's program. So our discussion today will walk us through the critical steps on the do's and don'ts of measuring innovation and leadership with the help of patents, with a panel of experts who have done years of research on these topics. So let me turn to them now. We are joined today by first Mark Cohen, who is now a director and senior fellow at the Berkeley Center of Law and Technology. I worked with Mark while I was the director of the USPTO. Mark was also our expert on China IP issues and has dedicated his research career on unpacking and understanding market-driven and non-market IP trends in China. He remains one of the world's true experts on these issues. Dr. Jonathan Putnam, CEO, competi uh, Competition Dynamics. Jonathan is a PhD economist with expertise in, in methodologies to evaluate innovation and intellectual property. He has served as an expert witness in many court cases, and his widely cited research has focused on patent valuation and understanding global IP trends. Next, we have Tim Pullman. He's the CEO of IPlytics. Tim founded IPlytics to provide the data insights on patents, especially standard essential patents on critical technologies. His research has been used by the likes of the Wall Street Journal to understand who leads in the critical technologies like 5G, as well as the European Commission and the German Ministry of Energy and Economics. Last but certainly not least, my colleague at CSIS, Dr. Kirti Gupta. She will moderate this panel. Kirti is a senior advisor at CSIS and she is also the chief economist at Qualcomm. She is not only an economic expert on evaluating innovation and intellectual property, on the geopolitical trends in technology, but she is also a former engineer who, who deeply understands all of these technologies. So with that, let me turn the panel over to Kirti. Please go ahead. Thank you, Andre, for uh, that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to CSIS. This is meant to be an interactive webinar among colleagues. We all know each other. We've done you know, work and research in the same area for a long time, but we bring completely different perspectives. Mark from the government and academia, Jonathan as an expert witness in courts, Tim as a founder startup analytics, and uh, me from the industry. So let me just take a step back and start by asking your perspectives on the big picture question. Why is there so much interest in patent data these days? Uh, and um, Andre, you come from the policy world too. Policymakers want to determine who is leading in critical technologies. Media wants to capture answers on these global technological race that we are in, right? And the courts sometimes need to have practical answers to difficult questions that they're grappling with. They need to determine value of patent and patent portfolios. So in your respective worlds and fields, 
how has this played out? Let me start with you, Mark. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Kirti. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, certainly, patents have become hot uh, uh, in a way that they hadn't been in the past. I think uh, Director Yanku uh, uh, summarized very well how the, we may be at an inflection point in our relationship with China in particular, and that kind of existential threat that weighs on many of us in evaluating the future of the U.S., but it's also played out in other contexts. I'm going to go to Amazon and search for books on IP and technology in China or, or 5G and the like, and you'll find that there's a lot of popular books out there, as there are popular articles. So this is something that's really kind of penetrated rather deeply, for better or worse, into the U.S. popular mindset and the minds of uh, journalists. Still, uh, there are a number of issues uh, that arise from this uh, uh, related uh, engagement uh, on patents and on intellectual property. Uh, you know, the media still sometimes gets patents confused with trademarks and copyrights and other IP rights. Uh, people sometimes forget that they're disclosed documents. They're not the only measure of innovation in the world, although they are a very important one, in part because they are public. Uh, criminality is often conflated with patents, when in fact there is no criminal remedy required for patent uh, infringement. And in fact, we don't have one in the U.S. except we do award punitive damages. Patents are technical. Uh, so many uh, journalists and and many average people lack the technical background to understand minuscule differences. Uh, patents are territorial. There are different kinds of patents. All this makes it pretty complicated uh, for media that wants uh, 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 a, a discreet, impactful message from, a, from an article that uh, borrows on the audience's uh, limited attention span. Uh, so, you know, it's important to keep in mind in, in this context that while patents are extremely important, it's part of an ecology of innovation, the one that exists in the U.S., one that China has been trying to cultivate uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, and there are other indicators like scientific publications, high tech manufacturing, uh, uh, education, talent retention, immigration policies, startup funding, et cetera, that all go into creating the kind of ecosystem uh, that the U.S. has benefited from historically and that China is trying to imitate. The Silicon Valley still remains the envy of the world in many respects. Uh, uh, and other countries are trying to do it in other ways. Uh, yeah. I think it's really important though, that when we look at patent data, that we not only look at the ways that the data is used or are not used, but also to keep our minds focused on the prize. Uh, and in this case, and I think what drives the media is the prize for China is to become the most innovative economy in the world. Uh, and I think also to achieve a measure of uh, not only civil innovation supremacy, but also military uh, and, and other areas, including control over its own uh, 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 population, if you will, and stability. Uh, so these are playing out in a very, this data is really playing out in a very broad global context. That policy will not change in China, will not change significantly. The data will. And we have to track it well to anticipate how China is implementing that policy. Thank you, Marx. Because, you know, I think you touched upon some things we'll unpack on the technical side, do's and don'ts of patent data, but also the incentives. The incentives of the media to sensationalize some of the findings because of the current geopolitical, uh, you know, competition we are all living in. Tim, you know, you deal a lot more with the industry, right? The industry is looking for answers. Uh, governments are looking for answers. Uh, what's your perspective? How do you feel the uptake of patent data has just, you know, evolved in the last 10 or so years? Yeah, I think um, the problem with patent data is that it's probably at the same time the best measure of innovative outputs and the worst, right? Um, it's a great measure in a sense that um, companies really have to disclose their inventions in a patent, right? That's the deal. If you want a monopoly on your on your invention, you need to disclose that. Um, and that's probably the best window into innovative activities of a company, right? And even more, um, we have states and patent offices, third parties that actually grant a patent, right? It's a third party that validates your patent is novel and there's an inventive step. So all that is, of course, great in, in that sense. But um, at the same time, the problem here is that people tend on just counting patents. And I think if you think about the definition of a patent, a patent must be novel, right? That means it's unique. 
Um, and you can think of an idea, a novel idea um, that disrupts the whole market. Right. Or several ideas that then become a patent or a patent portfolio that really disrupt the market, that change trajectories that, you know, become market success. But you can think at the same time about ideas, um, even if they are novel, they have no impact at all on economy. Right. They might be having a very marginal impact. Some even have no impact at all. So counting patents would mean often, at least you put all of these inventions the disruptive ones and the marginal ones and the you know the ones that have no um impact um uh, on economy at least at all in uh, it, together and count them right and that of course very quickly is misleading um why is it still done because people like you know the simplicity of it right counting things is easy um Wall Street Journal leads headlines. They don't need a very sophisticated, complex article about limitations of patent data, right? No one wants to read that. So when they looked at our raw data, uh, I have to always keep saying that, we provide raw data for marketing purposes so people see that we have that data. Um, when they take that data, of course, they like it because it's easy to understand and they publish it. And they don't, they don't sometimes even mention what a standard essential patent is. They just say, who's leading in 5G? Um, and then they count patents, right? And um, I think that is the, the complication here. The simplification of patent counts and what it means has led to these misleading um, headlines in, in the industry. Um, and that's, I think, the problem. How the do's and don'ts. Thank you, Tim. So basically, you are saying the same thing. You know, there's the real appetite, growing appetite for use of patent data to understand who's leading, who's not. Media is looking for easy answers. People are looking for easy answers. Now, Jonathan sits in the courtroom and they're not looking for easy answers but we've seen the same i would say trend of you know trying to grapple with patent data what's that trend like and why well <clears throat> normally patent data would be irrelevant in the courtroom uh because uh, courts typically solve disputes over individual patents but as the world gets more interconnected and as the technologies to connect it become standardized then the courts increasingly scrutinize the terms on which firms license entire portfolios to each other. So for example, in the Federal Trade Commission's case against Qualcomm, one of the questions was, is Qualcomm charging too much for its patent portfolio? And so then a natural first question to ask is, well, how big is Qualcomm's patent portfolio? And does that size justify the price that Qualcomm is asking? And this is true now, not just for Qualcomm, but in uh, telecommunications and in many other technologies generally. So we do see courts looking for answers to these complex questions of um, how do you value a patent portfolio and should we count patents to do that? Right. So we'll again, we'll talk about unpacking the methodology in a moment. Andre, you have lived in both worlds. You live in both worlds. You live in the policy world. You are a litigation li licensing practitioner. You're an IP expert. From both perspectives, what's been your observation in this increased demand for patent data? Yeah, so look, from a policy perspective, it's critically important to have accurate data and to try to uh, get behind the data to understand exactly what the data shows, because policy decisions are being made in the United States as well as in Europe um, with respect to intellectual property laws, with respect to innovation incentives and the like, uh based on this data and uh without it uh it's really really difficult to uh to have an accurate picture so that we can assess do we really have a sputnik situation where they got ahead of us and what do we have to do about that or at the minimum are they catching up with us that was one of the main motivations for us to put out that pto report in january 2021 i'll have to say though there's lots of other data and even if you know, take, for example, patents, even if that data is to be taken with a grain of salt because of non-market factors, as I've mentioned, and as uh, Mark and others have mentioned, there are other trends, whether it is scientific publications, the number of uh, graduates from technical schools, on and on, uh, the percent of R&D dollars spent as a, compared to the GDP and so on, all the trends, as far as we can tell, go in the same direction. We can have discussions about the accuracy of other data within a particular trend or a set of statistics, but overall, 
everything is moving in the same direction, including things like you know, participation in standard setting committees, leadership of those standard setting committees, and the like. So in addition to the specific data, I think it's important to also look at the overall trend lines. Thank you, Andre. So look, now that we have established that, you know, like Tim, you said, patents offer themselves as an important and frankly, one of the most observable metrics for R&D. And every one of you is saying there's a real demand for this. There's a real appetite for this from the policymakers, from the courts, from the media, from the industry. They're turning one way or another, you know, with or without pitfalls to patent data to determine who's leading in these incredibly complex technologies in an increasingly complicated world. So now you're all experts, systematically help us unpack what are the specific pitfalls of using the patent data then? How wrong can one be after all, you know, in using patent counts, do they serve as at least an important compass to navigate the map? Um, let me start with Jonathan because you know, you have to be precise in the courts. Yes. Well, I've um, I've spent 40 years doing this, and and my original graduate school project was to try to answer the question of how can we improve upon counting patents. Um, so uh, the easiest way to think about this is by analogy. Uh, suppose that you were trying to decide who had spent more on groceries. You were looking at two grocery carts, and you decided to count the number of items in the grocery cart. Um, would you would that provide you with information? It would provide you with some information. Um, are you likely to be right? Sometimes, and sometimes not. And the reason why, of course, is because the items in your grocery cart are going to differ based on your income and your preferences. And some people buy many small things and others buy a few large stakes. So um, counting the number of items in a grocery cart is a, is a poor, but not uh, completely uninformative indicator of the expenditures in that in that card and so what you're really doing when you're talking about patent data is restricting the analysis to simply counting items instead of actually mirroring the process that a uh, homemaker goes through in selecting those particular items from among all the possible choices given a certain set of prices and actually the uh solving the incredibly complex economic optimization problem that he or she solves in a grocery store it's exactly the same for R and D. And if you don't go through that process and you just say, well, I don't really have a lot of time. I'm just going to count the items in the shopping cart. You are quite likely to get this badly wrong. It's like Einstein once said, not everything that can be counted counts and that not everything that counts can be counted. With that, Tim, let me turn to you. You've used this data. Like you said, it's been, you know, used and abused in various ways. Uh, what's your big takeaway and how do we improve? Um, I mean, yeah, I think many people know um, I founded IPlytics, which is a data company, right? We provide access to data, mainly patent data, patent declarations, contributions, these kind of things. And I think one thing we understand very well that um, all of that data, by the way, is public, right? Um, the, the, the main reason we even have a business is that raw data that is available publicly to everyone is typically useless, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have a business at all, right? Um, if, if it was all for free, because it's public, and everyone can, can have access to it, there would be no business. So um, just using data as it is, is it, it doesn't give you answers, right? It's impossible to place any decisions on raw data. And that's why not only us, other patent analytics companies have a business to start with. Now, I think the big question is, of course, um, what, what, how do you refine the data? And, and you know, what are the methods to do that? And there's a lot of research, um, many of us here present today have contributed to that research to discuss what are good measures to refine patent counts, right? We could use forward citation, we normalize that, you know, to, to make sure there's no trending effect in there and, and things are comparable. I think what is important also is what question are we actually asking, right? Um, when we think about leadership um, in technology, we can also ask, um, are, are we counting in everything that is granted, let's say, or everything that is pending and granted, because we want to see also the latest inventions. Are we counting in also the Chinese patents, even though we know they are probably subsidized, or are we counting in certain offices that we trust more, also in terms of the quality of the patent office? And there are many more of these questions, because 
you know, I know our customers ask these questions and we provide ways to do and refine the data that way. But it really sometimes is about that question because you can come up with different results um, using the same data. Um, there's a report by the USPTO using our data and they show, well, the US is actually also leading the 5G patent race, right? And they have refined the data a bit differently than others. And the Wall Street Journal didn't refine the data at all. They use our raw data because that's what we give out for free. Um, and, you know, they come up with, uh, with different conclusions. So it's, it's really about that. Um, yeah. I think data is important um, because we need something, you know, we need something. It's better than nothing, right? But we have to be very careful. Um, what are the questions asked? How do we want to answer them? And how do we have to refine the data to be able to get something, to shed some light on what's going on? So basically what I'm hearing is you can get a completely different answer if you don't refine it in the right way, as you know the Wall Street Journal did versus the USPTO's more uh, technical report uh, about leadership in 5G. Mark, let me turn over to you. you. You're following the geopolitical trends. Andre alluded to those, right? They influence how we deal with this, uh, you know, who's leading in which technology by counting stuff. Uh, what, what are some of your insights from your research? Yeah, so I've been following Chinese patent data in particular for some time, and I, and I did it really rather crudely initially, uh, just from looking at observable trends. Actually, you can see a lot a lot more than just the shopping cart, to use uh, Jonathan's uh, uh, analogy. Uh, I remember looking at uh, patent filing data around 2005 and noticing that, gee, most of the patents that China filed at the USPTO were by research institutions and were in fields that were unrelated to China's exports. Uh, so that suggested to me that there were motivations other than commercialization of the patent, the patent, even suing on the patent, and filing for the patent. So that was probably true at that time. Researchers wanted patents to show that they had a new invention, not necessarily that they were going to uh, commercialize it, uh, particularly in the economy of China at that time. Uh, there were other noticeable trends like um, seasonality. I noticed that, gee, all the patents that were fought, being filed by China at the USPTO were at the end of the year. And that was also true at WIPO. And I called up WIPO officials and I said, gee, don't you have a problem now? If these patents keep on increasing, you're going to have to hire a new staff for a Christmas rush. And what do we know about those patents? Why, why are they rapidly increasing? Uh, and eventually with these and other observations, uh, um, you know, I worked with economists or sometimes inspired economists to write papers. And we noticed, in fact, for example, with respect to seasonality, that yeah, it's about uh, a disproportionate high number at the end of the year. Not only that, they are generally of lower quality in terms of citation rates or in terms of maintenance rates. Uh, uh, and they also are more likely to be subsidized. Uh, 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 we also, it's, it's really a rush to get money from the government, uh, 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 in part because you can make money by filing patents. And that drove down quality. And this is a global phenomenon in terms of patenting from China. So. It's, it's really um, uh, uh, a, a useful endeavor because you can start disaggregating the Chinese data, uh, looking for signs. And some of them are crude, but observable, uh, like the uh, 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 shopping cart. Uh, uh, they just need a little bit more data uh, and analysis from folks like Tim or Jonathan so that it become meaningful to folks who look at uh, statistics uh, and, and, and uh, have access to other um, uh, data sources. Uh, the, uh, we've seen more and more of this data playing out in, in different contexts, not only in research contexts. I think the PTO report on 2021, which several people have spoken of, is an important indicator. The fact that we have economists in all the major patent offices in the world is a very positive trend. And that's not only true of uh, uh, patent offices, it's true of large patent holding uh, companies and elsewhere. So we are seeing more of a data driven approach to this issue. The PTO report in my view, was part of a trend at the PTO, beginning not only with OCE, but also with the China Resources Center that I helped set up at the Patent Office to use more data-driven uh, uh, approaches to understanding policy, uh, uh, of, of looking at how China's uh, efforts at patenting are driven by non-market externalities. And we saw this originally with trademarks, uh, where there's a huge increase in trademark filings from China, often low quality, no quality, even fraudulent, uh, 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 and largely respond to subsidies that were 
originally located in Shenzhen in southern China, but has spread throughout the country. And then you have the PTO report that comes along and also says there are distortions in patent filing, including incentives for filing, participation, standard setting organizations, uh, PCT related distortions, which I don't think they get into so much, but China offers a subsidy to a limited number uh, for a limited number of national phase exam examinations for PTO file. What is the result of that? China generally doesn't file many national phase uh, 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 examinations per PTO filing to me. You look at a country like Norway or Israel, they're up around six or seven, the US maybe four or five. You have patenting to the uh, uh, plan, patenting to the metric. Uh, and all these reports are really important in terms of understanding where China wants to go. And also, uh, perhaps scaling back on the apprehension we have, or even better, uh, 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 developing strategies that address where China really is headed, where the gold is hidden in that lead, so to speak, where there is real values. I'm not totally discounting China. I don't want anybody to walk away with that assumption. Uh, there is real innovation going in China. There's also a lot of smoke. Right. So, so how do we find that real innovation and how do we speed it out from the smoke? Let's turn to that for a moment. Look, you know, consistent with my research, sitting in the industry, looking at the patent data, I can, I can basically uh, vouch for validate the fact that there's really no correlation between patent counts and patent value. You know, we've looked at large portfolios. We have access to some of the, you know, ratings given by experts by eyeballing the patents. And, and this is, you know, consistent with the established fact in the literature for over 30 years. You know, I invited Brown and Hall and others uh, to some of these webinars before, and uh, they have uh, papers, heavily cited papers that talk about no correlation between patent counts and patent value. Yet here we are, and we are trying to understand how do we determine, like you said, Mark, you know, with all these geopolitical trends going on, who's leading, who's not, where's the smoke, where's the mirror? So Jonathan, let me turn over to you. What can we learn about the relationship between patents and R&D? Can we, anything? Well, as a matter of fact, that was the subject of my dissertation and um, I'll try to, try to keep my remarks on it to under an hour and a half, but uh, briefly. A minute uh, and a half. <laughs> yes, a minute and a half, there we go. Um, the, the, what you really wanna do is mirror the process that a person who has discovered an invention follows when they obtain patent protection. So they ask themselves a series of questions and then they act on the answers to those questions. Uh, and if you actually model that process, you can learn a great deal. So for example, one of the important questions that they have to ask themselves is, in what countries do I want to obtain patent protection and why? And so if you then model the choice of the of countries where people file for patent protection, then you can um, explain to yourself why they did so. Obviously, the size of the economy matters. But what's even more important than the size of the economy is what's the quality of the invention that motivates one person to file in 20 countries and another person to file only in one or two, even if they're large. If you can nail that down, then you can actually eventually recover the entire distribution of worldwide invention values, which is what I did in my dissertation, and combined with other information on the cost of filing and the distance apart of countries and the trade between the countries and all these other things that economists would care about, you can actually figure out the entire value of global patent rights and then relate that to the R&D that gave rise to those patent rights. So when you solve this as a structural problem, as opposed to simply trying to count things because they're easy to count, then you can actually recover incredibly meaningful information um, but you have to actually think about it from the point of view of a person who has made an invention. So Jonathan, I, I, John, I want you to talk about, you know, a recent paper that you wrote, I found very interesting on trends in China, like Mark was saying, right? Like what was the correlation? And, you know, there was a R&D trend in China and a patenting trend in China. And how, what, what did that tell you? But let me turn to you in a minute. I want to quickly ask Tim about this question and then Andre and then Mark. Uh, patents and R&D. Input, output, effort. Anything we can learn about that from the patent data? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I think obviously it's 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 for me it's um, 
R&D spending and then output and how, you know, what comes in between is again, it comes back to the same question. There are companies with very little R&D spending that make incredible disruptive um, ideas and innovation and other companies spend a lot of money on, and the outcome is not good, right? So I think we end up at the very same point. Um, I think it's important to have all data at hand. Um, at least we do that at IPlytics. We try for that specific field that we are in, right? For the telecommunication, 5G standardization or Wi-Fi standardization, we try to have as much data available as possible, not only patent data, but other data sources as well to get the full picture. But even if you have the full picture, I think everyone should think about how could these numbers or these counts be driven. Um, to give you an example, there are incentives to file more patents if you get money from the government. There might be also incentives to get to file more patents because it makes your shareholders happy. Um, there might be reasons to send a lot of people to standards meetings because apparently some people use that in court and it gives you a better idea of who is, you know, strong in a certain standards development group. If you think about all these incentives, why you may increase your own counts, right? Um, these are again independent from the actual innovation, the actual people in the labs that are innovative and that create, you know, something new. Um, and again, it, it doesn't matter if you spend a lot of money or little money, I think um, the outcome matters and we, not, we need to somehow be able to measure how innovative and how disruptive that outcome is. So can, I think- Can we frame the question differently moving on this point, Tim, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you right away. Very good. Um, let's be helpful for our audience. And let's ask, let me ask you in a different way. Is there anything useful we can wean from the patent data and what is it? What are some useful things that you can say sitting here right now? Okay, you can learn this, this, and this, but you cannot learn about quality. You cannot learn about value. You cannot learn about who's leading in technologies, but you can learn about effort. You can learn about priorities, like you know some of them that Jonathan was talking about. So quick list from each of you. Yeah, if I if I can start, I mean, most of our clients, why they use our data, and I think data is very important. Again, we are selling data in a software to analyze it. Um, most of our companies or uh, users, they want to know who's actually active in the market and what have they, when have they started to be active, right? So you get a full picture of companies that are active in the market because if you don't have a patent, you cannot have a product, you not you cannot sell anything in our technology space. So that's super important, and you can really see when they started this. When they enter, when they came into the market, and what's interesting about patent data, typically you don't file patents for your products you have today. You file patents for your products you have tomorrow. So it's actually not only in a window into innovation; it's in a window into future innovation. So that is the best way to really understand what's going on in terms of what are trending topics, what will become important in the future, um, who are the players who spends most of their time and efforts. If that is in the end the technology leadership. That's, you know, that's to see. But again, numbers show you. Um, and again, so patent data is very helpful. Otherwise, you know, there, there wouldn't be a business like mine existing. Um, and it's one of the best ways to identify technologies and, and maybe not crown a winner in the leadership, but you can find the people that are part of the leadership for sure. Mark, Andre, any comment? Uh, sure. So, look, I think there is a lot of info that can be gleaned from patent data. I think, uh, on the other hand, just looking at the raw numbers, that, is, that can certainly be misleading. I don't think it's irrelevant. I think there is some information you can glean from raw numbers as well, but it's misleading for all the reasons that we discussed that, in particular, the non-market factors. Let me add another potential that there is this incentives to increase your numbers and there's all kinds of tricks you can do. Not only can you just file more on, on smaller quote inventions uh, that otherwise you might not file on because you don't have these incentives, but also within the same patent application, you can get one patent or you can get many patents. It's, you know, you can split up a patent claim by claim if you want, for example, um, with continuation applications, divisionals, whatever. And all the modern jurisdictions have that type of a system. And I don't have any 
specific data to back this up, but I believe to it to be true, and Tim might know, but I believe to be true that uh, uh, Chinese applicants uh, or applications from, from China file more split applications, whether by divisionals or the like, than applicants from the United States. Why? Because they have incentives to increase their patent counts at the national level. Uh, so just looking at the numbers definitely is not good enough. On the other hand, we can tell the trend or certain trends from that. We can look at behind the numbers and see where are these numbers increasing. Let's look at the technology underlying the increase. Why is it increasing in that particular area of technology? And with, with, with sufficient resources, I do believe that you can take that data, you can actually look behind it at the actual applications, and you can learn, are they valuable technologies that they're applying on? Remember, a patent is a public disclosure. The word patent means to lay open. So the whole point of a patent is a public disclosure. You have a specific use somebody could use that researchers could use that to tell us how valuable are the new technologies emerging from china versus the united states europe and wells elsewhere so i think using that data in a positive way can be super helpful with technical expertise Correct. that's what you really need to yeah and by the way andre you know what you were talking about you know splitting patent applications into various uh patent applications with continuations and all that, that makes a lot of sense because it's a, you know, it's a, it's an available tool. And the, if you have subsidies in a system and if you have, you know, it's great for the patent offices, the incentives seem to be aligned to allow that. Um, so I, that should show up. Um, I do want to make a very important point here. There are very legitimate reasons to have divisional and continuation plat patents and, and to split patents, so mm -hmm. to speak into mm -hmm. multiple applications stemming from the same disclosure. Mm -hmm. There is a very good reason that all the countries have this process. All the uh, uh, modern IP systems have this um, for, for reasons we can discuss. What's not good is if people do it for no good technical reasons or legal reasons, and instead they're doing it merely to increase patent counts. And yeah. By the way, whoever's doing the research here, folks like Tim and John and others that are looking at these statistics, it's not so easy to tell, right? What's the motivation behind the split, okay? Because we should not forget that there are very legitimate reasons that need to be maintained, but somehow we need to distinguish them from people splitting only for patent counting uh, uh, increases. See, this brings us to this really important point that um these tools whether it's patterns or how you file them or how you split them exist for good reason if they are misused in some specific context that doesn't make the tool bad <laughs> but we really need to focus on the incentive structure we need to create an incentive structure that doesn't create the incentives for a misuse in this case there shouldn't be an incentive for inflating patent counts. If we don't buy into this methodology of, hey, who's leading in 5G or AI or quantum, let's count the number of patents and let's publish reports and let's write media articles about this, that incentive would disappear. And let me turn with that on, you know, on that point to the courts, right? Many courts have grappled with the same issue. They have tried to apply practical methodologies to evaluate patents, to evaluate patent portfolios for real, like industry reasons, right? You have to determine damages or licensing royalties of patents, who needs to pay whom and how much. And some courts have had to rely on counting patents, uh, what is called in our technical fields, a top-down approach, where courts have to determine, look for a technology like, um, I don't know, 5G or, you know, AI, there is a aggregate like a total royalty cap like a realtor coming to your neighborhood and saying all the houses on the street must cost you know a million dollars some cap and then they say okay now we will divide this cap among different patent owners based on who has how many patents so for example if you know tame and i and jonathan have 
patterns in the same field and uh, I have 10 and Tim has 20 and Jonathan has 30. Uh, Jonathan gets three times more than me and Tim gets two times more than me. I may have the home run and Jonathan in his 30 patterns may have nothing, but you know, that's the tool, that's the rule that courts have often applied in cases like, you know, in Avachi OIP Ventures and TCL versus Ericsson. Uh, Jonathan, you're an expert at this. Uh, more recently, some courts have explained the pitfalls of these methodologies, right? Like in the uh, UK Supreme Court in a famous case, Anwar Khanit versus Huawei, the court actually said, you know, in the context of standards and standard essential patterns, that this idea of over declaring or inflating counts really creates perverse incentives and we shouldn't be using these methods. So let, help me unpack these developments in the courts. Uh, what would be your practical advice to judges, to panel of experts in the courts to use a sensible methodology to rely on? Um, and then we'll get back to the media and the analyst audiences. Jonathan, I think I would like to start with you on this. Yes, well, th uh, thank you. This is a, a, an ongoing source of uh, frustration for me because um, in most technical fields, uh, electronics or chemistry or biology or something like that, courts defer to scientific excerpts because they don't uh, presume to have that kind of expertise on their own. In economics, it's quite common for a judge to say, oh, uh, because you're trying to craft a remedy and judges believe that they are able to craft remedies, um, they resort to methodologies that an economist would say is either overly simplistic or outright wrong. So a judge can understand that firm A has 10% of the world's patents. And so therefore, based on overly simplistic reasoning, it should get 10% of the world's royalties. And that's not considered a, um, a violation of the judge's duty. Whereas if the judge were to make an equivalent determination about chemistry, then that would be considered uh, a, a violation because it's a, the subject of expert testimony. So one of the things that needs to happen is that economics needs to be treated as the science that it is and uh, I think appropriate deference given to um, the history of research in the field, which would not allow you to draw these kinds of simplistic conclusions. And if you can't, if the judge can't draw them, then you won't have advocates trying to persuade the judge to draw them. Uh, but instead, you, you know, up the game um, by getting better quality expertise. So I just testified in the UK in a case where it was a pitched battle between two econometricians and the judge was you know not pretending that he knew anything about how to do econometrics. He had to defer to um, the expertise of the witnesses. That's often not the case in other jurisdictions, particularly the U.S. So this is helpful, and not to mention you know the perverse incentives simplistic methodologies like counting would create. If you know money and royalty payments depended on that, then people would play the system and inflate their counts. Andre, you have a lot of experience, obviously, in the courtroom. What would be your advice? Well, <clears throat> again, I would try to uh, to make sure that they use the technical experts and they admit uh, testimony that uh, they get beyond and behind the numbers. Um, I would absolutely figure out a way to make sure courts understand that the numbers are just that numbers and they might show you something but you really don't know exactly what they show you until you have the experts both technical and economic to understand exactly what they're what they're showing you so i would definitely you know i would advise judges not to take numbers at their face value uh, i don't think they should ignore them either uh but but uh, try to find a way to get behind them Thank you. And let's now turn to the industry analysts and the media. So Tim, you and Mark, you, you <laughs> have, you know, lived in this world as well as have the rest of you and me. Uh, they're trying to unpack the dynamics of the industry, right? They want to know who's leading in which technology area. We want simple. We want easy to understand answers. What can we rely on and what should we avoid? Me? Um, well, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's to start with, I would not probably recommend a uh, mass media article to come up with a very simplistic bar chart of companies and counts, right? Because that's something people understand, but that's highly misleading. 
Um, these are statistics that I would just not suggest any reporter to use because, you know, if you want to use it, um, you have to be very, you know, technical about it and explain what the numbers mean, the limitations of that, and no one wants to read about it, right? We are economists. We read, we read like 60 pages papers. Uh, half of these paper uh, pages are um, limitations of the data, right? And that's important in our field. You know, you have to think about those. And also what we call a bias, like a systematic bias, that certain numbers are high because there's an outside effect that we cannot observe, but it kind of biases the results. It makes some companies look stronger than they really are. Um, all of that is impossible in mass media because you don't, you know, people don't want to read that. So I would recommend not to publish these kind of statistics. What they should publish instead could be trends. Like there are an increasing number of 5G patent declarations, right? You know, again, the magnitude of this trend we can discuss, but at least the trend itself could be of interest to the, to the public, right? And there are more filings now also coming from China. Again, should we discuss the magnitude or just the, the pure trend? I think there are, there is data that is super interesting that people will care about, but there's other data and statistics you can create that are just easily to be read and are, are misleading. Um, what what we do is uh, at IPlytics, for example, we we also of course do not know the answer, right? I mean, if someone is asking me who is leading in five G now, you know, what what should I say, right? Um, we we are we are data people. Um, what we typically do with our data, however, we correlate that with with technical data or information from technical experts that actually read the patent, right? And the patent is, takes takes a while to read it, and it takes even longer to understand it, and it takes very long to claim chart it to really understand: do these claims relate to a certain standard or product or whatever you know is at, at, that we discuss here? Um, and we correlate with we correlate our data with these expert information on how valuable a patent is, how relevant it is, how essential it is. And we find certain data points that help you um, understand a correlation of value and you know the real world data or the the truth, if you may say. Um, and you can use these as indicators. Again, this is not going to be telling you the truth for every patent, but as to the rule of large numbers, you can you can make assumptions about the value of a patent portfolio, for example, and these kind of things. Again, nothing that I would necessarily publish in in a in a Wall Street Journal article because again, you would have to explain the whole methodology behind it, and that is again difficult. And we do know there are people out there that get paid and they come up with certain numbers and statistics um, just to make one company look good and the other not, right? I mean, there are so many other reports on 5G that use some magic trick to identify essential patents and one company is number one. And obviously that is a sponsored report by a certain company. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's very risky to do these things and then quote these things again in mass media. So I, I would suggest talk about trends, you know, don't crown some winners, uh, even though it makes headlines, but it's just misleading what's actually going on. And the cost to society is huge because then you create this race to, you know, file a lot of patents, uh, you overload the patent offices, you create a different perspective among the policymakers that, you know, Andre and others have had front seat dealing with, uh, which is actionable plan on misleading data. So uh, that's a really, really insightful point, Tim. Thank you. Mark, anything yeah, you would sure. like? Sure. So, uh, you know, there is a bit of a cottage industry of patent counters. Um, uh, the Global Innovation Index from WIPO uh, relies heavily on patent counts to determine the innovative capacity of a country. They have other factors, but they use the raw numbers and they're unadulterated raw numbers. You know, X number of patents filed, X number of PCT filings, uh, utility models, what have you. Uh, and many other people do do that as well. How many patents? Uh, company files, how many patents are filed from a state or city or region to suggest innovation. Uh, so you, you, are, you do find uh, it's a little bit of a salmoning exercise. The, the, the main current is simple, direct, uh, raw numbers, uh, and a bit of a suspension of critical thought because as my anecdote that I said earlier suggests, you don't have to be an expert to see that there are weird things going on, particularly with respect to China. Why is everybody filing at the end of the year? Uh, I used to uh, 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 present a chart that says that if China wants to only be to be truly innovative, they have to declare there is only one season, which is autumn. Because 
uh, uh, two thirds of the patents are filed in the autumn. And when I would present that to a Chinese audience, they would all laugh. They immediately understood what I was saying because it's government quotas, mandates, mandates, et cetera. And an American audience would look really puzzled. What's Mark talking about? What does Autumn have to do with innovation? Well, it ha has to do a lot with uh, incentives. So some of these things are readily accessible. Uh, uh, and some of the data, even the raw data, is very suggestive of perhaps alternative conclusions that people are not looking at. Uh, for example, the huge amounts of patenting in China, whether they're invention patents, utility models, or designs, which are so dominated by Chinese filers, 85% of the invention patents, 99 plus percent of the utility models, 95 plus percent of the designs. China is creating a great wall of patents. You know, low quality, no quality, high quality. There is a great wall of patents that has been built that is several multiples of filings in the United States. If you lined up every individual inventor in China in a line that filed in their own name, what we would call a non-service invention in China, it would be greater than the total number of applicants at the USPTO. That number alone. So there is really interesting raw data that has significance coming out of this market. I mean, you have to realize that China in particular is a highly numbers-driven environment. And you could, you could compile the data as it exists without going to citations, forward, backward citations, without looking at some of these other really useful metrics, and you would find um, uh, some really interesting things. A another point I'd, I'd also like to say about the raw data, if you will, is, and some of the others have already said this, this is the predictive quality of patents. If people are filing in, in, in particular areas uh, and it's, they are emerging technologies, that can be very indicative of the importance of those technologies as perceived by industry or governments. Uh, and uh, this I think is particularly important in an era of civil military fusion. Uh, a lot of military applications are coming from civilian uh, 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 projects and the uh, uh, distance and time between the military application, the civilian invention is narrowing. So using the predictive uh, ability of patents to come up with that kind of uh, security analysis is, I think, extremely important and extremely valuable. Wow, super interesting. Now, Andrew, can, please go ahead. Can I respond very quickly uh, to just follow on a mark? Because I hope the audience is paying attention what Mark's latest comments here are so critically important. So I just want to emphasize a bit about them. First, in terms of the raw numbers, um, uh, they certainly cannot be ignored, but you know, patent offices themselves, USPTO included, um, the, and WIPO as another example, they all put these numbers out and they use them to drive their own performance and to tout one way or the other the you know the innovation, the state of the innovation economy. We know this. I mean, it happens every year. USPTO announce, announces we, you know, we've increased the number of applications by X percent. Um, it drives the number of employees they take. Um, conclusions are drawn during during the COVID pandemic. Conclusions were drawn. Statements were made. Innovation has slowed down nationally and internationally. Look at the number of patent applications. Governments are putting these numbers out. I'm not saying it's wrong because they do show trends, but they need to be a taken over a grain of salt. And two, keep in mind that there's a difference when you look at the data at the macro level, whether it's national or international, versus looking at data specifically within a technology area and more importantly, company to company. You know, if you're trying, if you're in court and you have company A versus company B and you're trying to determine who's got the more advanced, you know, who's got the more valuable technology, you know, that huge grains of salt for that raw data, as opposed to national trends. But even at the national trends that we've been discussing, you need to look behind those numbers as well. The second point that Mark made was with respect to China, the creating a wall of patents, you know, whatever we say about the numbers, and I know this is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular uh, program that's focused on data, but whatever you, we say about the data itself and the numbers, the mere fact that China is putting out 
so many patents is important and policymakers need to attend to this. Number one, it's creating a minefield over there, making it more difficult to penetrate with real innovations and companies from the US, Europe and elsewhere that are trying to obtain protection in China. And by the way, this is not just patents, also on the trademark front as well. Number two, it's creating huge amounts of actual prior art. These are documents in the Chinese language that examiners at the US PTO, the European PTO, uh, Patent Office, whatever it is, have to read and assimilate as they decide the validity of patent applications in their own offices. And this sheer volume of written output that's put out by this office, um, you know, not necessarily reflecting real innovation perhaps, nevertheless has a huge impact on the ability to obtain protections domestically uh, in other countries as well. So, so, so really important for policymakers to attend to this. These issues fundamentally have to be addressed by the US government in trade negotiations. And I'd love to hear from Mark on this a little bit too, time permitting. They fundamentally need to be addressed in trade negotiations between US, and Europe or whoever else and China. These non-market trends, non-market incentives need to stop because it's distorting, not just the numbers and the number game, it's just distorting the ability to protect real innovation uh, uh, globally. If I could, Andre, that, that was great. If I could just interject very quickly, uh, Kurthy, because I think Andre uh, uh, drove the points home uh, um, uh, very well. Uh, on that, that last issue about what, what needs to be done, uh, it's a very difficult issue, I think, for governments to grab around because we're really talking a lot more about the future than the current moment. We're really challenges of the PTO, uh, SIPO, uh, EPO, et cetera. Uh, there's a function here in diplomacy, uh, 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 properly exercised, of telling an emperor when he has no clothes. Uh, uh, and uh, it's been rarely exercised with regard to China, in part because we wanted so long for China to be an IP economy. Uh, we didn't think that they would um, overindulge on that goal uh, through all these other... But China has recognized years ago, they recognized they had a lot of low quality patents. Uh, not reflected in WIPO reports or other external reports or in court judgments, but they said, you know what, filing subsidies for patent applications is just generating a lot of patent applications, many of which are not granted. So what did they do? They silently stopped reporting statistics on patent applications. So you'll find December 2020, the data stops uh, uh, for patent applications. They only went to patent grants. Uh, but I, 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 so, you know, getting those messages across, and it's not only to the government of China and subsidies, it's also to courts, uh, US courts and foreign courts that do patent counts. And it's also to uh, antitrust agencies. You know, I, I, when I was in the government, I tried to get DOJ uh, and FTC to come down to the PTO to talk about emerging technologies and what is the value of a patent and av avoid raw patent counts, which is a, temp a temptation to a busy bureaucrat, frankly, even one who knows better. Uh, so there's a lot of places where this has to play out we have, to make it a more qualitative driven vision and also to tell the emperor uh, when he has no close. So here's my quick summary of this <laughs> fascinating discussion on where this is ending. It gives us actually a CSIS project to work on that I would like to invite you all to. My quick summary is this. In an increasingly complex world when an in, with an increasingly large amount of data where these systems are being used and gamed for different incentives, the scarce resource is how do we draw the right insights by uh, correcting for the selection biases by correcting for the various trends at play and really wean out the insights that are actionable for policymakers, for courts, for our 
industry and for the media. We need to have, and here's a pro project proposal, a do's and don'ts list, right? Like uh, you, you mentioned a lot of things in this webinar, all of you. You know, we started by talking about why is patent data so important right now to observe leadership? Why is that a critical question? What are the pitfalls of that patent data? What are the geopolitical trends that corrupt it? And we're really ending the discussion with so many different uh, trends at play, right? Like it's not just the increased patent filings in China and the subsidies, it's also how the US Patent Office and WIPO and others are reporting this data and uh, sort of playing into some of those incentives that we need to address and create some sort of actionable insights that can help um, enhance our overall systems of continuing the right incentives for innovation. So I think we should do that. We sh that should be our step two. As a step one, I think we have to put together a summary of this discussion and post it on the CSIS website, along with the link to the webinar, and then start this working group that can unpack some of the questions that have come at the end of this seminar. So let me close here. But before that, uh, let's give our industry and media friends a bone here. They're tuned in. 10 seconds answer from any of you on the burning policy question these days. Who's leading in 5G? Who's, what about AI? What about quantum compute? Is China leading? Is there a close competition? What can you say? 10 seconds from each of you. Mark, let's start with you. Uh, I would say um, uh, it's it's mixed. Uh, 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 China has certainly emerged, but it has to, its data has to be taken uh, very uh, cautiously. And legacy players uh, uh, still have a very important role to play and continue to innovate. Uh, uh, but it's also something that demands constant attention uh, by competitors, and it has dramatic security implications as well, which means we can't relax. Jonathan? Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You can't uh, get innovation without spending money, and the United States is still spending a lot more money than China, which means it's on average going to be ahead. That said, Huawei is now uh, stating that it's the second largest um, spender on telecommunications R&D of anybody in the industry, passing Qualcomm and only slightly behind Samsung. So if you think that that's not going to yield results, then you're crazy and you need to pay attention to actual expenditures because those actual expenditures will yield actual innovations eventually. Thank you. Tim. Yes, I, I can also agree. I wouldn't crown a winner for the race of 5G, but um, I think it's interesting to observe who is in the market and, and maybe not even uh, not only looking at the top 10. I think most of the newcomers in the market also come from China, and that should be alarming, too, in a way that, you know, if you think about the past 10 years and who has entered, let's say, the top 30 in technologies like 5G, Wi-Fi 6, video codec, there's a lot of Asian players or Chinese in particular in there. Those need to be monitored. They don't even have product in the U.S. market yet. Maybe they will never, but they are strongly investing in that technology. That should be observed. That is a trend more than saying who is first, who is second. I think the U.S. players are strong, one of some of the strongest. But, um, you know, we, I think there are not too many other U.S. coming after that, right? There's, there's not a U.S. startup that now entered the top 30 anywhere. Thank you. Andre. Well, in 10 seconds, the answer is I don't know, Kirti. I don't know who's leading right now. What I do know is that we are in a race uh, for 5G, artificial intelligence, and all various other types of technologies in the next industrial revolution. And uh, we need to compete. We cannot ignore the innovation that's taking place in China. And the United States needs to double down to make sure all hands are on deck and we do whatever we can to commit ourselves to win the, uh, uh, this uh, technological race um, and at the minimum give our companies the ability uh, and all the tools they need to be competitive and succeed. Thank you, Andre. With that, I think we have come to an end. Andre, let me quickly give you the mic for closing this discussion and just as a quick reminder, we will be posting a summary of this discussion on the CSIS website with the link to this webinar. All right. Well, thanks, Kirti. Uh, thanks to all the uh, uh, panelists. Uh, really. 
fabulous conversation. Thank you, Mark, uh, Jonathan, Tim, for your insights, Kirti, for your leadership. Thank you also to CSIS uh, for uh, allowing us to put this uh, program on and uh, to enable these uh, conversations on such important topics. Look, the bottom line is, uh, as I said, I do believe we are in a Sputnik moment, in this generation Sputnik moment, and it's not to be ignored. It's really important. The consequences will be generational. Um, who will actually lead in reality, not just in patent counts, but who will lead in the actual technologies of the future uh, will define uh, our economy, national security, um, and uh, so much more for generations, uh, generations to come. What is key, as I said just a minute ago, is to uh, make sure that our government, our governments enable our industry com uh, uh, companies to be able to compete, to in be incentivized, and to put their commit their resources, uh, both time and financial, to making sure we um, we succeed in this next industrial revolution. Uh, but for this, policymakers need to commit the nation um, uh, to these goals. The fact of the matter is, in the 1960s, at the beginning of the 60s, in 1961, President Kennedy saw the, real, the, the original Sputnik moment, and he said, quote, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, the 60s, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth, close quote. That was real leadership, committing the nation. And then he went on to say, to motivate why we do this as a nation. He said, quote, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because the goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Those sentiments are true today, and that much more important because there is more than just one area of technology. Multiple areas of technologies are converging. And they're converging as between the technologies, and they're converging as between economics and national security. Our leaders need to commit the nation that we will compete and we will succeed. And for this, our leaders need real data, and they need to understand the meaning of that data, and they need to understand the positives and the negatives, and they most importantly need to understand what goes behind the data and what it truly means when it comes to technological leadership so that they can make the correct decisions going forward. So let me stop there. Thank you all for joining us. And please visit the website at the Renewing American Innovation Project at CSIS. Lots more information there on these and other topics. Thank you all.